Okay, it's uh, 1.30, so I think we can get started. Um, thank you all for joining us for the first session of track one. Uh, we have ideas uh, taking off in Launchpad. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Emerald, Equinox, and Mobius. Um, and I will hand it over uh, to Taryn and Katie. Um, I'm very excited to see what they have to present today. Okay, now how do I, okay. You can see my slides now, right? Okay. Yes. Well, hi, everybody. Oops. Uh, my name is Taryn McKenna. I'm the Pines Program Manager for Georgia Public Library Service. And I am one of the Evergreen Bug Wranglers. Um, by saying that it might sound fancier than it is, uh, I can do a little bit of code, but I'm not a core developer. And I say that because I want to emphasize that you do not have to be a developer with a capital D to contribute to the health and growth of Evergreen. I mean, if you are, that's amazing, and we would love to have your uh, contributions. But if not, um, you know, you at whatever level you are, if you understand uh, how your job works and how the software should help should work to help you in your job, then you can contribute to Evergreen. Now, although this is the first session of this conference, I'm sure by now you've probably heard the term open source. Um, by that, I mean there's no licensing fee. The code is freely available to download and customize and use for your own organization. But it also means that there's no commercial corporation that owns it or is fully responsible for it. So we, the people here in this session, and all of the other Evergreen users around the world are really the caretakers of the software, and we are responsible for maintaining and improving it. And that brings us to Launchpad. So Launchpad, and I'm going to put a couple of links here in the chat. Um, actually, whoops. Oh, I, I can do that. You go ahead. Okay, great. Um, there is, is a, chat, a link to the cheat sheet that I've put together so you don't have to write everything down. Um, and then the direct link to Launchpad as well. So Launchpad is the software that we use to track all of the wish list requests, bug reports, discussions, uh, code that is ready to test, um, status of existing uh, code, um, for example, if it's been tested or not. Basically, everything to do with the Evergreen project goes through Launchpad at some point. Um, so this is the Launchpad interface. This is the main page of the site, and I hope that's large enough for everyone to see, all right? Um, I don't spend a lot of time on the main page, but there are a few interesting things here. Um, there is a link to the Evergreen site, the main site, and the Evergreen Wiki, which is where um, a lot of the documentation and uh, user tips and best practices are stored and to the downloads page and the downloads page also has the release notes for each uh, version um, with detailed information about what is included in each version over here under the series section um, everything in black the releases in black are releases that are already out and the ones in white are the upcoming releases so you can take a look and see you know say if you're on 3.8 um you might know uh you'll be able to see that there are new versions 3.9 is out now um and then you'll also see that there are point releases available so um master is the main core code that's you know the cutting edge of everything that's been approved to go into evergreen and then periodically the release team uh, which is made up of, volu of volunteers uh, from from amongst the development community, will freeze master and package that into a numbered release. Um, so 3.8, 3.9, 3.10, and those releases will have all of your major new features and new interfaces. Um, periodically, they will also uh, collect bug fixes that are applicable to a main version and package those up as a point release. So for example, 3.8.1 is going to be a point release of bug fixes for 3.8. Um, 
Oh, I want to point out over here, there's a subscribe to bug mail and there's a little uh, cheat sheet or there's a few notes in the cheat sheet for how to do that if you want to subscribe to bugs with certain tags. Uh, you can also subscribe to all bugs if you want, which most people won't want to do because there's a lot of activity. Um, I do it and it can get kind of overwhelming sometimes. Um, but most of the time we are going to spend on the bugs tab here. So the first thing I recommend you doing uh, once you log into Launchpad for the first time, and I should say that the, the login link would be up here and anybody can register. Um, you just have to have a uh, email address. Um, the first time you log in and go to the bugs page, I would click on the little gear icon and set what fields you want to display on this main screen. Uh, I like to see the tags and the age and the date last updated. Uh, personally, I don't really care about the package, um, but you can use whatever you want and you can change that whenever you want. And the reason I recommend doing that first off is that it also adds sortability for all of those fields. So now that I've added age, for example, I can sort all of these 2,692 tickets by age. So I can see the newest one was submitted 11 minutes ago. And if I reverse sort, there's one wish list item that's been around for 12 years. Um, so um, one thing um, that you can do as a new user is take a look at um, different categories of bugs and we categorize those by tags. If you sort by tag um, here, one thing that's a good thing to do to start out is to reverse sort by tag and you'll see all of the tickets that do not have any tags yet. And I mentioned that that's, a, that's probably the easiest way to first start getting involved in Evergreen and it really helps the discoverability of those. Um, there's also a tags list over on the right. So you can see there are 305 tickets that have been tagged for the OPAC, 276 with cataloging, et cetera. Um, the tags are really important in Launchpad because the basic search isn't all that great. And I'll get more into the advanced search later, which does work really well. But the, the basic search is honestly kind of useless. Um, it only searches open tickets and it only searches the titles and the first comment. It doesn't uh, search any of the other comments on the pages. Uh, if you click on any one of those bugs, I'm just going to go into this one here. So this was a critical bug and it says it's fixed committed already. So fixed committed means that it has already been tested and approved and submitted into master but it hasn't been released into a point release yet or into a major release yet. If I click on that, you can see a lot more information. You can see when it was submitted and by who, this happened to be mine. Um, you can see what the current status is. So 3.8, it was already released actually in, in the point release for 3.8.1 and it has been committed to 3.9.1, but 3.9.1 hasn't been released yet. So as soon as that gets released, then it will be there. You'll see a description of the bug. It's always a good idea if you're submitting a bug to put the version number um, and any other relevant information in there and any steps to recreate the bug so someone else can test it. Screenshots are acceptable too. Um, then you'll see that uh, Jessica here has confirmed that bug. So. Um, if you're looking at a new bug, it will um, say, let's see here. Well, I'll go back to it, but um, it'll give you an option to confirm it if you can verify it. Now, it's always a good idea to only confirm something if it's been reported by a different organization. So if I reported this bug, um, you know, Elaine that I work with wouldn't be able to come in and confirm it because we work for the same organization. And that's just for one thing to make sure that multiple organizations are seeing the same problem um, and also agree that it's a bug because sometimes it's a benefit or <laughs> it supports one, one organization's workflow but not another's. Um, and sometimes it's just a local configuration issue so it's not really a bug at all. 
Um, so there's additional conversation. Anybody can comment on the bugs or add additional information. Um, and then Katie's gonna get into the actual workflow, but you'll see that someone here has submitted a fix, then it was tested, and then it was signed off, and then it was committed. Um, and Katie will get more into that. So if I go back, and take a look at a new bug, or actually let me take a look at the status. Um, so here are a bunch of new bugs. When it says new, it means nobody else has confirmed those yet. Some of them are already marked as wish list. Some of them are undecided. So if I go into this one that's 15 minutes old, I can say, um, I can read it. If I can, uh, it says staff client will return deleted records when searching with group formats and additions options. Okay, so I would need to confirm that bug and see that it is already, um, that it's actually a bug and not just a local configuration issue. And then I could go here to status and click uh, confirmed. And there's a bunch of different statuses here. Um, I could also, as a bug wrangler, I can also set the importance, but for regular users, you won't be able to set the importance. This one does not have any tags, so I could click to add tags and put in um, whatever the relevant tags would be. Um, so if you do a type ahead, it will give you a list of matching authorized results. And in the cheat sheet, there's actually a list with descriptions of all of the different possible tags. Um, we try to keep it fairly well organized so that uh, the tags make sense um, and don't get too overwhelming. Um, now this comment already, this may actually be a duplicate, so it will need a little bit further attention um, to see if it's really valid or not, or if it's already been reported elsewhere. Um, and the other thing you can do in here is add heat. So you'll see a little heat number over on the right. Um, if you are logged in, you'll see an option, this bug affects X number of people. Does this bug affect you? And if you click the little pencil, you can say, yes, it affects me. And if it does, then that will add heat to the bug. And this heat helps prioritize to developers how many people it's affecting and how important it is to fix. Um, now let's see, make sure. Um, if you are actively developing uh, a patch for a bug, or if you are working on testing it, you can assign it to yourself. So you click on the little assign to and just click assign me. Um, I'm not actually working on this, so I'm going to remove myself. And then, um, sure. And then the other fields like the target to milestone that that happens with the release team works on that. Um, so. I just want to mention the search really quick. If I go back to the main bugs page and click the advanced search, um, this gives you options to search by different statuses. So you can, if you you know know that something was already released, or if you can't find it, you can add the fixed release to your searches. If you think that you reported a bug, or that you commented upon a bug but you can't find it now, you can click the little magnifying glass and say "pick me." and that will search the bugs that you reported. Um, I do that all of the time because I can't remember what I called things. And you can also search, search by tags here. Um, so for example, if I want to search tickets that have been signed off already, um, or that have pull requests rather, and a pull request means that there's a piece of code that's ready to test, but I only want to look at the ones that are ready to test and the ones that haven't already been tested, then I can do pull request space minus signed off. And those are both authorized tags um, that are in the description list. And I can say all, and this will show me only the ones that are ready to test, but that haven't been signed off on yet. And I can see there's 94 of those. So I know that was a really fast overview, but we only have half an hour, so I'm going to turn it over to Katie. <laughs> and there's a lot more in the uh, cheat sheet as well. Speed launchpad. Yes, there is um, There is a lot more in the cheat sheet, which is a really useful tool. Um, I will just say that 
I am a, uh, a, a regular user. I am not a, a bug wrangler and I don't do um, development. And so uh, the things that you'll see on, on my screen are, are things that, that any user can do. Oh, can you not hear me? I can hear. Okay. I can hear you fine. So um, there, is, there is a little three dot button next to uh, each name um you can't you can mute someone for just yourself so um if someone could note that in the chat because i'm realizing if someone can't hear me then they're not hearing that explanation of why they can't hear me uh but i will continue on so um i would say you know the first things that are useful to do in launchpad are go ahead and sign up for an account because that then lets you add heat and add subscriptions and then that kind of, you know, as you're looking at bugs, I know in our consortium, we send out emails when there are bugs that we want to increase the heat on. And so we ask people to, if this is something that you're experiencing, if this affects you, please go ahead and uh, subscribe to the bug mail or add heat to this. Uh, because that is useful for the for people like Taryn uh, and the release team and others who uh, do development directly or work with development to know what is affecting the greatest number of people. So that's a way to to be involved with this and to be engaged with this that um, is is skills that we already have as information professionals. So that's a really easy way to go ahead and just get started. Then um as you start to get more familiar with the with these bugs um you know I, someone had asked earlier can just anyone air quotes uh go ahead and move a bug from new to confirmed and i believe taryn that as long as you have a login and we do ask that people obey that um if it's not from your from another organization a different installation of evergreen um, then you can go ahead and confirm that. It, that does not prevent it from later getting marked as a duplicate or anything like that. So people will continue to do those steps um, as, as things are going on, but you can, you can go ahead and do that. And I will have to say that the first time I did that, it was kind of scary, but then it was totally fine. <laughs> so, uh, and then commenting on bugs as well, just saying this is affecting me, my library, my patrons. This is the name of the um, consortium that we're in, and this is the version of Evergreen that we're on. And so just, just providing that as a comment is useful information. Uh, if you have obviously more details or ideas, then you can um, you know, access that a number of ways. Uh, or sorry, you can go ahead and share that in, in the comments and that would be great but just something that brief is also helpful. Uh, let's see, I also wanted to note before I go through a specific bug that, and I believe that there is a, there was a, a pre-conference yesterday and I think there may also be a session during the uh, conference about documentation bugs. And so, There are two, there's a documentation tag and a bite-sized doc tag. And so if you're someone who writes documentation and you're, or you're looking to get into it, these bite-sized ones are really great ones because they're little things. And so that's something where you can go and see a bug and actually correct the bug. Uh, and so that's a, that's a fantastic way to kind of get into it as well. So let me kind of take you through this is a particular bug that was something that uh, I know that I had heard discussion about for a little while. Uh, and so this was a bug that was added as a wishlist item in Evergreen 3.4. And the original idea uh, was to have a way for people to share on their own library website, uh, carousels of books that they got in Evergreen. So uh, in an earlier version of Evergreen, we'd gotten the ability to add our own carousels to the OPAC. And so then libraries often wanna have that same functionality put on their own website. 
So, you know, there's already a standard that could work for this, which is RSS. There are some other ones. Um, and so then this is something where it was reported in 2020. Um, and then we see uh, our Taryn here. I, I picked this one partially because she's been involved in it. Um, she is just saying, you know, this is something that affects us and we'd like, we'd like to see action on it. Um, and then there's a lot of discussion back and forth on uh, ways that people um, would like to see this kind of rolled out or just desire format. Here's one from my consortium. Um, and then uh, Taryn, in this case, went ahead and wrote the code <laughs> to do it. Um, and then there's back and forth, there's testing um and uh, it goes you know through this they implemented it in, at, in a test environment in pines and uh so then this is something that is uh was released in three eight question mark yes yes so this is available um for everyone in 3.8 and uh, then it will then be continued on in, in the various uh, iterations of Evergreen. So that's kind of, you know, concept uh, all the way to implementation. And let's see, um, uh, we have some other ones um, and these are, some of these are, are pretty small ones uh so this is is one that the evergreen community development initiative funded um for setting uh default default width for display columns in grids and so you know there are a couple of different ways that these projects unfold so sometimes, uh, for instance, with the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, it may be an idea that we've brought up in our discussions about projects we want to prioritize, and then we actually create the launchpad bug to then have that discussion be open to the entire community and not just the ECDI members. Sometimes it happens the other way, where it's a bug that a community member has submitted, and then any number of consortia and groups, a consortia of consortia like ECDI, um, might take it upon themselves to say, okay, this is something that it doesn't look like anybody's working on right now. We're going to go ahead and take this on and start working on it. And so Launchpad is a big part of the way. Um, and Vitiga was talking about it this morning with get the GitHub issues pages, that the discussion happens about what's going to get developed, what's going to get developed next, and what's important to users, and how is it going to get paid for. So I, it's a great tool, and I encourage all of you to uh, spend a little bit more time with it. I think that's everything that I wanted to say, and I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Taryn, did I miss anything? Um, if you want to go to the last slide, um, there are a few notes on what you can do right now. Yes. Um, so if you are new to Launchpad or just getting your feet wet, um, just spend some time looking around in there, taking a look at what the existing bugs are that have already been reported. And as you do that, you know, go ahead and add heat to the ones that you feel are important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you see ones that do not have tags yet, um, take a look at the authorized tags and try to apply some relevant tags that will help those bugs get more attention. And if you are able to confirm bugs or wish list requests, um, you know, go ahead and confirm those if you agree and you can verify that they're valid. Another good thing uh, is um, to go through the really old, if you search by age, go through some of the really old ones and see if those are valid. Because there's some in there that are still from the old installed version of software that are probably not actually valid anymore, that kind of went away with the advent of the web client. Um, and then, of course, you can add additional information. 
the um, bug squashing page that's linked there at the end is um, where you can go to get kind of an overview of the what you can do um, uh, as a little reminder. And then the link to the tags page and everything is on there as well. Put in the uh, cheat sheet into chat again for anybody that came in a little bit late. And yes, um, Joan says, I find it helpful if people include the Evergreen release number and browser. Yes, definitely. Um, the browser didn't used to be important with the older versions, but now we do see differences. Um, for example, there was a Chrome um, bug that came out within the last few weeks that we weren't seeing on other browsers. Um, so it was only affecting Chrome users. Um, and Chrome has since fixed that, but for a little while it was causing problems for us. Um, the process for, what is the process for closing and hiding, removing old invalid bug reports? Um, the best thing to do is just to mark them invalid. Um, on the drop-down list where you can confirm bug, you can also mark it invalid. And usually when I do that, I will write a comment as well, just in case there's any questions um, to, you know, just say, you know, I've marked this invalid because it's no longer a problem with version, you know, 3.8 or whatever I'm on. Did I miss any other questions? Um, Lindsay, no, um, I believe anybody can uh, change the status of a bug. And if for some reason you can't, you can always add a comment saying that you think it's in, it's no longer valid. And then me or one of the other bug wranglers that gets all of the notifications will um, notice that and update it for you. And so, yeah, you can you can change this. And then everyone who um, is subscribed to the bug mail, which usually include should include the submitter and uh, by default would include the the commenters in, unless they turned that off, uh, is going to get notified of that. And so if the person who filed it is like, no, it's not invalid, uh, then then they can come back in. So, I, you know, you you want to be sure you want to do it in good faith, uh, but there there is a feedback process for that. Um, Benjamin had a couple of questions over in the Q&A too. Um, I'll answer the easier one first. Um, besides, confirming, besides confirming a bug initially reported by your own organization, is there anything else folks should be wary of doing in Launchpad? Um, I think it, uh, also if you're testing a patch that someone else uh, or that someone has submitted, um, you can test something that someone in your own organization has submitted, but you don't want to sign off on it unless a different organization has um, developed it because another organization might test it in a slightly different environment and find a problem with it that you didn't find in your environment. So um, uh, that's the main thing. Um, the only other thing you know, I would say is if you're sharing screenshots, you want to be very careful about including staff and or pay, exposing staff and yeah. patron information. Yeah. So screenshots are great, um, but you use a use a faux patron or a, a, the the concerto data set or, or something. Yeah. Um, so you're not you're not sharing uh, people's you know home addresses and phone numbers and things like that. And also, I think just generally um, doing trying to do your your due diligence and searching to see if something has already been reported before reporting a new one. Um, that can get really confusing. And sometimes, you know, the search isn't great, so it's hard to find. But, you know, with good tags, it's usually somewhat doable. Um, the other question he had was, also, uh, I'm not sure if this is the right place for the question, but I'd love any advice on how to keep track of all of the different catalogs and their jargony names. Um, do you mean the different organizations catalogs. Um, I will note that um, Jennifer Weston noted that uh, the cataloger breakout section is a 
good one to drop into if you want to uh, chat about especially cataloging related bugs or anything else. <laughs> and yes, Taryn froze and she is coming back. Uh, and and we do need to um, we need to wrap up because I believe that the next session starts at two. Yeah, it does. We don't we don't have an overlap. So, um, thank you all. <laughs> uh, appreciate your attention and time. And we're going to switch gears now.